Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to New Books in Game Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Rudolf Inders, the host of the channel. Today, we'll be talking to Miguel Sickard, the author of Playing Software, Homo Ludens in Computational Culture from 2023, and the publisher is MIT Press. Before we jump right in, though, I want to let you know that if you like our show, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the audio platform of your choice and share this episode with your friends or on social media. So, and now back to the show. Whether we interact with video games or spreadsheets or social media, playing with software shapes every aspect of our lives. In Playing Software, Miguel Sica delves into why we play with computers, how that play shapes culture and society, and the threat posed by factors using play to weaponize everything from conspiracy theories to extra capitalism. Miguel, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, uh, Rudolf. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to this. Yes. Um, I wonder if you could begin the interview by telling us a bit about yourself. Uh, sure. Uh, all right. So uh, my name is Miguel Sicard. I'm uh, originally from Spain, from the northwest of Spain. So I'm Galician. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've been living in Denmark, in Copenhagen, for the last uh, 21 years. I'm a um, professor at the IT University of Copenhagen, where I am the head of a new a research center called the Center for Digital Play. Um, so, so I used to. There used to be a thing called the Center for Computer Games Research, and a, a, about a year ago, we switched a little bit the orientation. We we changed the number of things, and we became the Center for Digital Play, and that's what I'm uh, currently heading. My background is in the humanities, so. Um, I've studied a lot of um, uh, productively useful knowledge and productively useless knowledge. So I am—I mm. um, have a, a little bit of a background in philosophy and in literary theory and in linguistics and so on. But I mostly teach, I guess, in the intersection of, of design, critical algorithm studies, and game studies. So that's where I teach. And I also think that's where my... my um, my research falls in, right? Sort of. So, and then I've, yeah, I've written this book, uh, Plain Software, which has just been published, and it's the fourth book I've written. Um, mm. I've, the things I've written before were um, The Ethics of Computer Games and Beyond Choices, uh, The Design of Ethical Gameplay, sort of a one, two uh, series of punches on how to think about and design uh, ethical gameplay experiences. And yeah. a book called Play Matters, which was my my tiny theory of play. <clears throat> Great. Um, I was I was just was wondering, was there any specific reason why you actually did change the the name from uh, Computer Game Research Digital Play? Because it seems to me, especially uh, knowing about um, the the background of the the. the the great, great, great Copenhagen IT University tradition of researching games. This must have been a, a, quite a discussion, right? It was. It was a bit of a discussion, and so the important thing is to say that um, we still do games research at the ITU, and in fact, uh, what used to be the Center for Computer Games Research is still exists as a research group inside this broader um, Center for Digital Play. I think. Oh. Um, what we wanted to do, so the, the, this is a little bit complex. So let me just explain it. Um, and I don't know if your audience will actually enjoy people explaining academic structures, but let's see. I'm sure, um, I'm sure they will, yeah. Okay, okay, that's good. Then, then you have the right audience, or, or, or hopefully. So um, the Center for Digital Play is an umbrella uh, center that contains four research groups. Uh, one of them is the Games Research Group, which is the old Center for Computer Games Research. Then we have another one called the Creative AI Lab, uh, which is a lab that works with uh, creativity and AI. You know, all these um, things that are so popular now, all the chat GPTs, all the DALIs, yeah. all of that stuff. Yeah. And they, they are, it's actually a, a computer science, deep learning, evolutionary algorithms focused research group. 
um, they are with us because a lot of the work they do is based either on on games or on play. Um, so so it, they fit very well with the kind of ethos that we have at at the at you know at the at the center. Then there's another group called the Media Art and Design Mad uh, that does mostly interaction design uh, with. Um, uh, cultural partners, typically museums, but other cultural institutions. Um, mm-hmm. And then we have a fourth research group called Digitalis, which is about digital life and culture. So they study how do we live in a digital world, typically using uh, uh, social sciences, uh, humanities, and, and sort of communication studies uh, work. So the reason why we, we switched gears was that... Um, while all of us in this center work together, games is not what pulls us together. I we have, see. we all mm-hmm. have an interest in games, but games are one of the things that we are interested in. And at some moment, it, it became a little bit difficult to think. Okay, so we are only going we are going to be identified with this object called games, right? Um, mm. Which is a very generous object in the sense that it's a liminal object. Uh, you know, my colleagues here have spent many years trying to de- define what a game is, and I'm not going to I go have, there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, but 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 at the same time, it was very difficult to find sort of these connection points that we otherwise have um, in this in this sort of broad research group. So we thought about maybe it's time to switch gears and say instead of focusing on a liminal object as a, as the thing that brings us together. We are going to focus on a liminal activity, play, something that it's very difficult to define, that can be perceived and seen in many different types of, of contexts. And that is what brings us together. So some of us study play in the form of games. Some others study play as a way of training machine learning algorithms. Some others apply play in museums. And some, some others see the play element in digital life. And so that seemed like a more coherent way of both doing a, a research center, but also looking at phenomena in in our life and in our societies um, that that are not restricted to games, but that can be explained through the concept of play. So, so this is a very long explanation as to why we changed yeah. name. It's very interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you because this this is highly interesting to me also. But I'm I'm sure our our listeners will appreciate um, this. So. Um, of course, we have to check for your Ludo street credibility, though. Um, so <laughs> please tell us what's your favorite game and the one or even the ones you are playing right now. All right. Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Let's see. Um, I don't think I have a favorite play, but I would say... Uh, or a favorite game, sorry. Uh, see, like I'm already... My brain is already mushed into play. Um, <laughs> I would say um, probably... Multiplayer FIFA between FIFA 10 and FIFA 18 is one of my favorite uh, multiplayer games. Um, mm-hmm. Shadow of the Colossus on the PS2, uh, not the remixes. I'm, I mean, the remixes are fine. It's a great game. But there was something about the aesthetics, the beauty of, of those um of the graphics and and the motion, besides all the you know lovely things about the gameplay and the and the world building, yeah. but like yeah, Shadow of the Colossus on the PS2 was mind blowing. Um, yeah, uh, I would say Spelunky. I've played many hours of Spelunky, mm-hmm. um, but then instead of instead of naming a game, maybe I, I would like to say that probably my favorite platform was the Nintendo DS. I miss the Nintendo DS. It was the it was such a great platform. There were so yeah. many things going on in it, and so currently. Yeah. Um, so since March 2020, I've played uh, Slay the Spire at least once a day. So I play the <laughs> daily and then maybe some more. Uh, and I would say that that is probably the game I'm still playing right now. I I dip dip my toes in many games. I try to keep an eye on like indie games, following uh, you know things like Warp Door. Um, I I also try to some of the AAA games, but but by the end of the day, I just go back to to Slay the Spire every day. So like that's mm-hmm. that's my go to both favorite game and uh, favorite ritual. Yeah, actually, I do remember um, talking about Nintendo DS. One of my best experiences I had actually, yeah, the uh, the the ability, the platform's ability to to only have one Mario Kart uh, module 
but sharing yes. the game with I think up to eight or seven other yeah. players, this was so much fun. It yeah. was mind blowing, and it was super yeah. clever because you 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 know Nintendo pushed sales of the console without necessarily binding everybody to buy the same game, and it's just mm. um, yeah. But I mean, I also remember. Um, I remember it fondly. Maybe it's not a great game, but I remember Hotel Dusk, which was mm, a, yeah. a sort of an adventure narrative game where you flip the console vertically. So you actually were holding it like a book. Mind mm-hmm. blowing. So like yeah. all the, the kind of crazy, wacky stuff that that console allowed us to do. Uh, the rhythm games for the Nintendo DS from uh, Rhythm Tengoku to... Uh, elite beat agents or or the Japanese uh, Osu Tataka Oendan. I mean, yeah, the, it was such a rich console. Uh, Lost in <clears> Blue, <throat> a fantastic uh, survival narrative game. I mean, I uh, I still have my I have two f- functioning Nintendo DSs, and I don't know over a hundred games. And it's uh, I I get rid regularly of of old games from old platforms, but I think I still keep a bunch of my PlayStation 2 and almost all of my Nintendo DS games because that platform is, yeah, I, it was foundational for my taste in in what I like in video games. It was, even though, you know, I got to it a little bit late, not late, but I was old. I was not, yeah. I was not a kid when, when that was released. But it, I, but I think it had, it had a, a, a bigger effect in me than than probably some of the machines that I played as as a kid. More than the Commodore sixty fours or Spectrums or Amstrads, I would I would say mm. that the Nintendo DS changed the way I, I see video games. Here, you're here, Nintendo. You got us. <laughs> <clears throat> now, circling back to your book, and what better way um, would there be starting with a very in seemingly innocent question because i'd like to start our conversation by quoting a sentence from your preface when you write in california i learned to appreciate fun in a different way and since i have spent some time in denmark as well i would guess now and point to the typical danish weather maybe (laughs) well i'm I'm looking through the window and it's pretty gray here so there's an element of truth that maybe Maybe everything is gray and flat in Denmark, and that's why my my year in California was so important. Um, <laughs> yeah, but but I think there's also something about, um, I mean, the my appreciate my Californian appreciation of fun. Um, it's a little bit double edged because on the one hand, I lived in Northern California, right? So this maybe does not apply to to Central or Southern California, but at mm. least in my experience of of a small town in Northern California is that. On the one hand, fun is a prime motivator for for life. Nature is so wild. The weather is so excellent. People are so friendly and open that 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 you just really want to enjoy. Um, so there's like a hedonistic, uh, almost a, like an ev- inevitable hedonistic take on the world uh, when you are in that environment. Mm-hmm. And of course... Just to be clear, when you're privileged enough to be able to have fun, right? Which is, in the case of the United States, it's not that simple. But, but you know, uh, at least in, in my case, I, I learned to appreciate that, that notion of fun as something that was less, that was both more concrete and productively vague um, than what I had thought before. Uh, and at the same time, it also has like a dark side because uh, the promise of fun uh, justifies a lot of the things that are wrong with with California, with the, with the United States, and and also with with uh, some of our sort of broader um, Western ideologies, right? So the notion of fun mm-hmm. is only allowed if you have worked, and fun is only um, the domain of the privileged. So like I learned, I learned to to appreciate the concept of fun differently, both positively and negatively in, in my year in California. The weather helped, but I think the weather was more of a catalyst than a, than a means. Uh, it was a means to an end rather than an end on its own. It was a catalyst for these reflections. Mm. But this is, um, if you mention the weather, this is not, um, I'm just trying to get a picture in my head because everybody's talking about, okay, Southern California, of course, but is this already, has this already been some sort of um, Northwestern kind of vibe, this this almost Alan Wake-ish uh, vibe to it? No, I think, um, 
it's very difficult to put because I lived in Santa Cruz, California, um, oh, and mm. Santa Cruz has nothing. It, it's not. Um, the, it it doesn't have any any kind of uh, northwestern. You have to go further up north to get that vibe. Mm. I think it has a. I don't. I don't know how to put it. It's more laid back than the mm. pretense laid back of Southern California. My experience ah, of LA yeah. is very limited, but yeah. it's more like it's almost wrong to take things seriously, but you have to take them seriously uh, anyway. Uh, I was told um, when I got there that the that at, at least in Santa Cruz, uh, you you work hard so you can play hard. So that's that's mm. kind of like the 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 vibe that that comes there so it's kind of like a weird keep keep santa cruz weird that's something that, that they appropriated <laughs> yeah. from austin so it's like it's a very weird vibe we're like yes sure man chill and enjoy the world but at the same time you still have to like live and produce and so on so like really really strange and um and super nice and i it's a it's a it's a little paradise on earth but like it also, it also, I think it also explains a lot why, you know, why Silicon Valley is there, right? Silicon Valley is on the other side of the mountains from Santa Cruz, and it really explains this kind of like weaponized hedonism of of Silicon Valley. Um, well, that's so, a yeah. So it's it's way closer if we want to do sort of like a media connection. It's way closer to the vibe in in some of the. Um, in some of the sequences in in the TV show Silicon Valley, than to Alan mm-hmm. Wake, there's no, there's there's no, or even the old movies of the Lost Boys, right? So, um, yeah. which actually takes place in Santa Cruz, um, so so it it has a little bit more of that vibe, right? It's uh, a, yeah. that's that's the that's where it um, that's where it is. Yeah, when you were mentioning the term um, "seriously" or the description, I was thinking about the, uh, I was thinking about the book "Half Real." You know, it's half seriously. Yes. Half <laughs> seriously, edition. absolutely. Yes, yeah. I think yeah. uh, I think that would be a that would be a good one. The, uh, Bart Simon has this paper called "Unserious," which I think hmm. it's like it's it's a really interesting take on on the concept of seriousness uh, as applied to game studies. It's um. I just, it's it's still my favorite paper of his, and I tell him that uh, every time I see him. Um, and it's not that it's not that popular. It's not that his, it's not one of his most um, read or cited papers. I think I may be wrong, but like it's a really good paper. It's like a really thought provoking paper. Yeah. Well, this tiny this tiny piece of conversation is actually a pretty good bridge, I think, to the to the next uh, talking point. I'd like to uh, talk to you about. Um, because only two pages later, um, where you sort of confess, see my air quotes right here, <laughs> that you hope that your <laughs> uh, that that your goal with this book is get together ideas that will spark disagreements and revolts. And additionally, you also write, "I don't even want to be right." So uh, please tell our listeners a little bit more about this process of, let's say, revolting. Right. Okay. So let the revolting idea. Um... I guess I like to 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 be a little bit provocative, and it took me a while to write this book. So, so I think it has to do a little bit with the history of this book. Um, Play Matters is was published in 2014, and this one is published mm-hmm. almost 10 years afterwards, right? And it's all the time yeah. it took me to write this book, but and that's because I started writing this book in California, and I was super certain of what I wanted to do and yeah. what I wanted to say. Um, and then I realized I. I'm not that certain of exactly what's going on. So I went from, I'm going to write this kind of uh, combination of a takedown of Homo Ludens and a, a sort of a, a specific theory of play for the information age to a more explorative text that, that tries to synthesize many things in ways that make sense for me and hopefully also for the reader. But... Um, that does not necessarily want to assert that this is the truth. So mm. I guess I went from like being this 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 more sort of assertive, like this is how I see the world, you know, understand me, I am right, to a more, I think it's productive to think in this way, but I actually don't know, shrug. Um, and, and, and I think that's what I mean by, by revolting, right? Because one of the things that I want to do with this work is to to decenter the importance of um, it's two. So there's two things about the revolting. One of them is like decenter the importance of 
um, oh, there's three things. Okay, so, so I, I'll, I'll go back to my own thinking. Okay, so first, mm-hmm. I want to decenter the the um, the core of how we study play. So the Hoisin has the Calois, all of that stuff. Um, when it comes to understanding um, how we play with software. Uh, and that also uh, means sort of bring new theorists in to, to build that scaffolding. So mm-hmm. I, I try to sort of throw, throw away Hoisin Halkalwa, all of these people, and then instead bring in uh, Maria Luganes um, as sort of the anchor of, of, um, of my argument and a little bit of the concept of boundary play by Christina Nippert Eng to, to sort of Try to say, okay, this is more. This is a more productive core of play. This leads me to a very provocative argument, I think, and I don't know, maybe it's not. Um, but I thought it, I, it provoked. I provoked myself, so at least I, I found it provocative, which is that um, in the digital societies, in the information age, make believe is more important than agonism. So. Our classic play theories and a lot of the way we derive uh, game studies from play theories or play studies comes from mm-hmm. implicitly or explicitly assuming that Heusinger was right, that play through games c- creates cl- culture, but that it is agonistic play. And I tried yeah. to do a little bit of, a, of that shift before in Play Matters, but in this one, I'm kind of like going in and there's a chapter, chapter four um, in the book, where I, I make the claim mimicry is way more important in digital play than agonism. So we cannot understand our life in the, in the digital world without mimicry. And agonism, while important, it's secondary to mimicry. And that means, or it should mean, a massive shift in how we study digital play. And so the third yeah. argument, the third provocative argument, is that digital play is different than analog play. And that I know that is going to annoy a lot of people because um, I'm, I'm all for like being like embracing multiplicities and like, of course, game studies should be about analog and digital games and so on. But I think it's way more productive to assert the difference between analog play and digital play. Um, yeah. If we don't do that separation, we are ignoring a number of. First, we are ignoring a number of things that digital uh, systems that we play with do to the world and do to us. Uh, and second, we kind of forfeit the usefulness or the use, the the utility of some of the work that we do in play and game studies beyond games. And I'm not talking, you know, about gamification and any of these things. I'm talking about how we are able to, say, understand the importance of world building in games, but how we can see instances of world building or we can use the vocabulary of world building to understand things like um, the construction of the self in social media. So like, I, I think that by claiming that digital play is different than uh, analog play or non-digital play, I, 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 I think we can actually do more in both game and play studies. But I know that that's kind of like um, provocative. And that's, I may not be right, but I'm, 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 you know, I'm at a point in my career where I like maybe don't want to be right. Maybe I just yeah. want to, to think things through. And if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. That's fine. I, I, I'm not the Pope. I don't speak uh, ex cathedra. So, so nah. I, put, I put ideas out there and hopefully people pick them up and, um, and complain about them. And one thing, though, yeah. that... Um, mm-hmm. So this decentering of Heusinga and Kalwa and so on, um, I think there's a movement now in game studies that, that that's doing that particular work. And I just got the other day on the mail a really good and what I think is going to be a really important book by Aaron Trammell called Repairing Play, which is doing this decentering or this uh, knocking down Heusinger from, from its statue um, from, from a black studies and black culture perspective, which I think is like, it's going to be, it's a phenomenal book. And I think it's going to be... Uh, a foundational text in how we can move away in games and play studies from 
the inheritance of these romantic theories of play that have been so productive. And at the same time, they have anchored us in a particular worldview, a particular uh, uh, politics and a particular ethics. So, so, so there's work out there that that's that's in doing that work better than I think my my book does. I'm not a very yeah. good salesman of my book, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, just for our uh, for the years of our listeners, so it's called repair repair play, right? Repairing, Repairing play. play, yeah. Repairing play, and the the author again, or Aaron Trammell. He's a uh, 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 associate professor, I think he's at UC Davis. Uh, he's mm -hmm. in, in one of the University of California. I'm sorry, Aaron, if you listen to this, I cannot remember where you are right now. <laughs> but anyway, it's, uh, buy his book and read it. It's amazing. It's really good. See, 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 <laughs> all this nonsense about not a bit of be being a good salesman. It's ridiculous. You made a tremendous uh, well. job. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, circling back a bit uh, from your arguments back to the two main premises uh, of your book, then uh, you write the first one concerns the time in which it is written in. It says we live in an at an information age. And your second premise follows up by stating that in digital societies, play has a role of shaping our understanding and experience of software. So maybe you could elaborate on those, those two points a little bit more for us. Absolutely. Okay, so the information age is, is a concept that I borrow from um, the philosophy of information um, directly, but it's not, it's not exclusive to that uh, philosophical tradition. And it's, it sounds great, but, but it's actually it's very simple what it does. The information age is a way of describing that period in history in which societies are thoroughly transformed by the ubiquitous presence of digital systems. So mm -hmm. this whole process of digitization from video games to digital IDs to digital banking to everything running through software, uh, computers and apps, and all of that stuff. What it, what it has done is to change um, or, or allow us to frame this particular historical moment as significantly different than the time before there were uh, all of these uh, ubiquitous digital systems. So the information age is the equivalent from a computer technology, computer culture perspective to the Anthropocene. So if the Anthropocene describes the period in history in which the presence of humans is visible in the um, geological and environmental uh, landscape of, of the world, the information age is that period of time in which digital systems are unavoidable in the experience of mundane daily life and the understanding of society. We cannot understand our societies if we do not understand the roles that computers play in it. So that's yeah. the information age. And then the second premise is that given this period of time, given this historic moment we are in, we need to understand how we relate to these systems. And my core mm -hmm. argument in, in the book is that we mostly relate to them by playing. So playing is a way of making sense of all of these systems uh, around us. And, and that is another of the provocative arguments of the book, where maybe I'm not right, but I'm, I'm actually claiming that it is the most important uh, way of making sense of, of these technologies uh, by playing. So playing is a way of making sense of what software does to our world. Yeah. We have talked about, or you have talked about the, the argument that digital play is different from analog play, but you also argue, and that's um, that's the second argument that actually rises from your thesis then, is that by playing we shape software agency as well as our agency becomes shaped by software. So how is this to be uh, understood exactly? Right. Um, so... Um, when we interact with, when we play with software, when we are in this kind of playful engagement with software, we, we need to think it about, about. We need to think about it as an entanglement, where um, agencies get entangled together and they shape each other. So what I can do 
I, I relate to software in a playful way and I, I make it act playfully, but I will only be able to do so in the ways the software allows me to do so by its own agency. So that is, I restrict the agency of software by playing with it and the agency of software restricts my agency by playing with me. Um, I guess the book came out maybe half a year too early, uh, or I wrote it half a year too too early, um, mm. because the best way of, of illustrating this right now is by looking at um, generative AI systems. Yeah. So when we when we write on the prompt of say ChatGPT anything. We are shaping it. Suddenly it becomes a writer, for example, of an essay. But at the same time, the prompt itself, so so the, the output of the prompt, sorry, shapes what we are looking for. So by writing a prompt, we are like testing the boundaries of what it can do. And by with the reply, it is the system is also shaping our agency. This is what you're getting. Act with mm-hmm. it. Um and we are we are trying to do all kinds of wrong things with these generative AI systems because what we are what drives us in our interactions is to is to play with them. Uh, the reason yeah. why ChatGPT and Dali are so popular and Stable Diffusion and and, and Mid Journey are so popular is that they are not sort of academic abstract uh, look at what a neural network or a, or a deep learning system can do. Um, nor it is, this is a search engine or this is an autocorrect system. It's really just like an open invitation. Look at what this thing can do. And then by entering it through this playful perspective, we are figuring out its rules, how it wants us to act, how it acts, and then we adapt to it. But at the same time, it is making us adapt to it. So the second prompt we write to ChatGPT is fundamentally different from the first one because we our agency has been modified by that output that it's the visible side of the agency of the system. So so that's mm-hmm. what I mean by that, by that kind of like our agency shapes, but we are also shaped by uh, the agency of the system. Yeah. I and could literally all... rewrite the book only about generative <laughs> AI because it's like, <laughs> and maybe I should, I don't know. <laughs> well, for the second edition, of course, then. Maybe. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I, I just eliminate everything else and just talk about the, all these generative AI systems. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that MIT Press will be more than glad. <laughs> I, was, I was wondering whether this, this specially, especially playful way of interacting with chat GPT, for example, now is also a good example because maybe, for instance, university authorities um, are full of suspicion when students start to play, to literally play around with, um, with a program yep. because they don't see the, they don't, they actually they fear the possible outcome, but not the process itself, right? Exactly. So I think um, I mean I really appreciate all these systems. I love them. I I really enjoy playing with them. But they are a whole mess. We've unleashed something in the world that we have no idea what kind of implications it's going to have. And one of them is mm-hmm. this about what qualifies. In, in learning as learning, right? We used to be the essay, the term paper is super important, but it turns out that it's so formulaic that an AI can actually produce resonant bullshit. They are not good essays, but they are well-structured essays. Um, yes. And they, they can pass as sort of decent stuff, right? Um they are clearly not good, and I'm sorry for everybody who thinks that they would pass those uh, tests. They they wouldn't. They would probably get like a low grade. I mean, but they would not. They are not on the level of a good essay, and maybe future iterations will. But what's interesting is, um, maybe maybe, and you're hinting at it a little bit in your question. Le- mm-hmm. I'm going to be provocative. I'm going to get in trouble. Let's see. Um, <laughs> Maybe the term paper and this kind of enshrinement of the term paper as like the way we have of making people or making sure that people have learned and know how to build an argument. Maybe it doesn't work. Maybe by forcing this kind of of 
um, mechanistic output, sort of almost computational output that an AI can actually perform, what we've lost is the play of learning and 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 the play of ideas. So like I'm super interested in my free time, whenever I have free time, on the on the notion of the play of ideas. Um, yeah. And how in in the university world, in the school system, and in general in life, um, it's not just learning, because that's almost like, a, oh, you, you know, you have a goal and a quantifiable output and so on, but a way of, of living in the world in a productive, rich, uh, um, creative way is to play with ideas. And I think maybe, maybe we at universities have realized that if ChatGPT can do the bullshit that we have been asking our students to do, then maybe <laughs> we are not asking them to play with ideas. And so, and yeah. so maybe we are scared because it's actually showing us that the emperor is naked, that we should definitely think about if the term paper is important, why is it important? And, and what does it tell us about this capacity of reflecting about ideas in the world? And at some moment, maybe um, we will end up thinking that what we need to do now that these generative AI systems are in the world is to teach people to play with them in order to play with ideas. So like that's, that's my, that's my, that's my hypothesis right now. Hmm. Yeah, but you also, you also introduce in your book uh, and you already mentioned her name, Maria Lugon's concept of playfulness as world traveling mm -hmm. as a way of understanding playful relations with software. And this then leads to your framework towards an, ethos of digital play um well, maybe let's deep dive a bit into uh, her and uh, your thoughts and ideas all right this is a this is my uh, I, i love it because i love talk, talking about this and i have a whole course here at the itu where luganes is the is the basic framework so like um how long do we have <laughs> um, well... all right so <laughs> <laughs> So, so let's keep let's um, keep it playful, but not too playful. <laughs> okay, so I'll I'll uh, I'll try to be synthetic. Um, yeah. First of all, Maria Luganes has nothing to do in her in her work, and particularly in her article about playfulness with digital world. And I even disagree. Um, there's a point of disagreement where she doesn't like uh, make believe, and I love make believe as a as a framework. But those mm -hmm. two things set aside. Luganes claims. And I think makes a makes a, a very good theoretical argument that playfulness is world traveling that is m traveling to others' worlds to meet with them there and to establish a relation there. So that requires a capacity from us as agents to loosen ourselves a little bit, identify who the others are, identify them as others and be willing to meet them in their otherness. Um, and in that process, she calls it world traveling, and I, I sort of extend it to the idea of world creation. So for her, playfulness is, I see others, they have a world, I will go to that world, try to understand it, and, and in that way, try to understand others. Mm -hmm. So that's the first foundation. And in the, in the argument that I build in the book, um, I take that idea and I say, we understand software as an agent in the world. It, it does things in the world. It's not, it's not if, if we want to go philosophical, it's not strong agency. It's like weak agency. So it's like it acts in the world. Therefore, we assign it agency. We don't necessarily think that it has feelings or emotions or whatever other things. We may build that layer on top of it uh, as a way of make-believe Uh, as a way of m being able to relate to that agency. But we don't necessarily mm -hmm. claim that whatever, um, chat GPT has feelings. But we identify yeah. its agency and then we travel to its world. We travel to the world of software agency with the intention of relating to it and playing with it. And in that travel, we create this new world, this new situation where my agency and the software's agency get entangled together. Yeah. A, a more mechanistic way of seeing this, a more sort of classic games or place studies way of seeing this is like, 
I have my agency and I see this software that has an agency and software has agency, agency through rules and procedures and, 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 and methods and, and all of these things. And therefore, I try to understand its rules and procedures in order to see how it works and how it works with me. And that's a really nice and productive perspective, except it's way too mechanistic. It does not explain really why we play with it. So we play in this kind of like classic, adonistic way of like, oh, I understand the rules and I try to break the rules or play by the rules, blah, blah, blah. But the the Lugones Mm -hmm. way really requires us to both have an understanding of ourselves and an understanding of the others and to have this willingness to meet with the other. And that's why when Lugones talks about world traveling, playful world traveling is loving world traveling. And I love yeah. using this word of loving world traveling because it, it has a very implicit ethos. Um, we are vulnerable when we travel to other worlds. We are vulnerable when we open ourselves to being in somebody else's world or to create a world with others. And therefore, we need to have an attitude that allows us that vulnerability, that allows us that laughter, that allows us that creativity, that joy, your, that fun, that pleasure. And that's what she defines as a loving attitude. So we uh-huh. should we should have this kind of loving attitude towards um, wherever we are going. And loving, loving, I mean, this kind of sound makes me sound a little bit perhaps um, sort of optimistic. I don't know exactly what it makes me sound, but I can, I can see that maybe it's a, maybe also a little bit naive. But um, I think that even, even the times where we try to break a little bit things like ChatGPT or DALI, where we do things like a prompt injection, I think that is loving in the sense that we understand uh, the agency of the other and we try to expand it in, in different ways. But that's, that's kind of like an extreme interpretation. Through the concept of loving, then I can draw an ethos of this form of play. Because when we travel to these other worlds, uh, when we travel towards these other agencies, we need to be respected. We need to be treated. They also need to treat us as others. They also need to love us as much as we love them, as, as much as we have this kind of feeling towards them, right? So when we try to use software to abuse the world, when we try to abuse software, or when software abuses us, there is world traveling, but it's not loving. And therefore, that's when we can start sort of drawing an an, an ethos of of digital play, that it's not necessarily, um, you know, about how bias and all of these other concepts are very important, but it's more like, what does it how does it travel to us? How does it shape our agency? How does it let us play? And so, and then Luganes has these ideas of like, uh, what is what is good playfulness? Uh, it's almost like a normative argument, right? So there's like a, yeah. a disregard of the importance of the rules. There's laughter. There's a willingness to, to make mistakes. There's a willingness to do shared exploration. And then everything that has to do with like conquering or winning or or limiting agency that's that's negative or not loving world traveling. So so this concept, which is admittedly relatively vague, and it requires, I think it requires more work. I think I'm going to be working on 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 this form of playfulness for the next decades or so. Um, but I think it's a very productive way of saying. Sure, it has rules and, and, and processes and so on, but we shouldn't understand them as play studies classically allowed us to understand magic circles, uh, rules, uh, order, and so on. We should understand it as agency we travel to. So maybe that's, okay, so maybe that's actually what the book does. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe what the book does it, is it says we should not understand software in the in the sense of a construct of rules and processes that that brings order as play brings order in the classic Heusingham way but software as a form of agency we need to relate through by playing and that's also why the title of the book is called playing software not play software or software and play and so on it is yeah. it is this sort of active process it's very much about the, the the activity the continuous activity of playing rather than than play so so there you go so that's a that's my 
brief and I don't know what was a ten minutes answer, but that's yeah. Uh, yeah. you did it. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. Oh, great! You did, you did it. Um, maybe order then is also a good uh, keyword for for our next point because um, you you also mentioning that playing software, playing software, yes, can also mm -hmm. and I quote you right here be an instrument to perpetuating inequalities, exploitation, abuse, and isolation. And I'd like to uh, hear what you actually, what, what are your thoughts here on what, maybe you can give some examples, some, some instances. This seems to be, um, this seems to be really important to also reflect upon this side of the whole uh, context. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Because because software has this sort of procedural order creation um, uh, nature, mm -hmm. it sometimes, and we travel to it with the intention of, of playing, if we fall too much into agonistic play, if we let it think that it's all about um, playing by the rules and that th these rules and the systems are fundamentally true and important, if what we value is... If what we if what we give importance to is the rules and the processes and not the agency, the acting, the playing part, then these computational systems can be used to make us play, and in doing so, play would become uh, an instrument to to continue um, performing inequalities or or exploitation. For example, and it's an example that I write about in the book, um, around two years ago, there was a, a lot of very good investigative journalism around the use of gamification in Amazon warehouses. Um, and of course, this is terrible, and workers do not necessarily like it. They are not necessarily enthralled by it. But the logic of the capitalist is very much games and play driven. Look, They say this is a terrible job, and you have to do, you have to perform all of these activities in the shortest period of time, uh, and you don't have uh, re uh, restroom breaks. But if you do so as a game, we are going to give you points, and because you like doing these things with points, at the end of the day, you are going to be able to win something, right? We are going to exploit mm -hmm. you, but wait, the exploitation is actually a game you like playing, you like doing things with rules, um, and because you like doing things with rules, there you go, uh, you are playing, you're not working, and we are not exploiting you. And, and, and I think this is a good example of how these systems, um, they, are, um, we re they are presented to us not as, not as something that has to do with agency, not as software that makes us do things, software that mm -hmm. shapes our agency, but actually software that rewards our agency. And I think that's, that's where it all breaks down, right? That's where it is actually a game that's used to oppress us because the game is shaping our agency. We cannot shape its agency and it's telling us what to do and rewarding us for it. But we are not relating to what the software tells us to do, the way the software shapes our agency. We are not world traveling to it. We are actually, we are actually being imposed a world uh, and some rules and telling us to, to act by it. But because this pool of classic theories of play, this pool of agonism is good, uh, is so important, uh, then we are stuck in this kind of closed worlds, closed logics of, of um, playful interactions. And, and as I make a similar argument to to try to understand the, the, the seductive elements of conspiracy theories online. How conspiracy theories online propagate because they often use these media that present themselves as game-like structures. So, mm -hmm. so we become, again, part of a, a competitive world where we see these rules. We don't see how they are shaping our agency. We just see as something that we need to tick some boxes and we can win, right? So, so that's, yeah. the, that's the, the argument of exploitation. Well, um, I got three more terms for you as, as our last talking point. <laughs> and there seems to be a connection somewhere, and I hope you can explain this to me. And two of them are names. Bolok, Lemieux, and yes. meta gaming. So, how yeah. do those three connect? So, so um, 
eh, Stephanie Pollock and Patrick Lemieux metagaming is one of my favorite game studies books of all time. I really, I really think it's a thought provoking book. And I okay. think what it, what I like about it is that, um, and maybe I'm, I'm misinterpreting them, but I, I hopefully they are fine with it. Uh, if mm-hmm. not, if not, if not, hopefully they will forgive me. But I think what metagaming tells us is, or the, the way I like to use their way of metagaming is that they say provocatively, look, video games are not games. They are, they are totally different objects. They, mm-hmm. Video games, what they, what they really are is software we play with, and that activity of playing is closer to metagaming, to gaming about the game, gaming about perhaps the, what I would call sort of the software agency, rather than mm-hmm. traditional gaming. So what metagaming did to me, and if I hadn't read that book back when it was released in 2016, my own playing software would be totally different. Um, yeah. So what, what metagaming showed me is that actually uh, when we are playing video games, we are not playing games. We are interacting with software in a specific way. And both our concept of games and our concept of play do not fit well with what software does in the world. And therefore, we need to think differently about um, playing software. So a lot of the... It's not that present in the book. Perhaps on the last chapter, on, on chapter seven, there's a, there's a little bit of metagaming where I try to sort of plot how the future would be. But, but what I find, maybe what's going to be driving my, my follow-up work um, uh, is going to be the idea of trying to, to figure out, trying to, to, to synthesize what um, Boluk and Lemire write about metagaming and try to turn it into... I don't want to call it meta playing, but the equivalent to meta playing. So, what kind of tactics can we use to playfully play with software? So, so, so for playing software, in ways yeah. that allow us to uh, be more creative, break f- away from these sort of um, computational discourses of of oppression. So, like I think that um, the book that did to those two things, right? It, it illustrated me how. Uh, software is a very different thing than than uh, whatever we had before, and it's now still influencing me on on ideas on how we should act differently in and play differently in in a world of software. Well, I have to definitely check this book. If you you you, pra- you praise it on such a high note, so I have to get <laughs> my hands on this book. This is this it's is a, my it's homework really, now. Really good. Yeah, so there's, a, there's, a, there's be, a bunch of books. Yeah, yeah. Because if um, I will have to read this because if you if you really uh, follow up your plan and rewrite playing software, I have to be ready. <laughs> and for our next conversation, have, you know, this is my homework now. Uh, I, nice, I nice. I, I'm I'm. I think you should just start by by reading metagaming. I don't know if I have the. The energy of, I mean, the book is out. I shouldn't be talking about rewriting the book, right? But it's more like, mm. I, I do have, I have had, I have just started a, a mailing list or what it's called, a, um, a, not a mailing list, but a newsletter. That's it, a newsletter. That's the word. Mm-hmm. When I'm trying to put into paper or whatever, put into bits, um, these thoughts about how does the framework of playing software allow us to think about generative AIs. So maybe it will not end up being a book, but a newsletter or, a website, or I have no idea. Maybe a sign. I have no idea. But um, but I I I definitely think that I would have written playing software very differently if I had this generative AIs. So one of the things that I'm a little bit, I think, uh, I think playing software could could have done with more concrete examples. Um, and I think part of the problem is that now the examples exist. They are out there. They are ChatGPT. They are yeah. Dali. They are all of this and all of the weird things that are peripheral to, to the systems, right? So like when people try to make ChatGPT generate sound by, by or um, sorry, Dali generate sound by doing uh, um, sort of drawing images of the sound. I mean, there's so much shit going on that's amazing yeah. and, 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 and super scary and, and terrible and, and phenomenal. And I think that like I could easily 
just exemplify each and every chapter of the book with a generative AI example, and it would be a lot of fun. So yeah. I don't know, maybe, who knows? Who knows? Maybe the second edition or the third edition, a revised yeah. edition, or maybe yeah. playing software, the generative AI edition. Well, yeah. For our listeners, um, maybe uh, maybe a um, maybe a hint. I receive on a weekly basis. I receive a newsletter called Web Curious, and it's a really great newsletter. And uh, if you're interested in all things um, all things concerning uh, AI, what's going on actually at the moment, he's um, dedicating a whole uh, his of uh, his very first segment of the newsletter is full of those. Um, those hints and tips where to go what to look at and it's really astonishing and i really cannot cope with all the amounts of uh, amounts of 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 entities out there so i think you're definitely right we have talked about then your your maybe probable way to go uh, for academic endeavors but mm, of course what will you be playing next miguel tell us it's also oh, important. what will i be playing It is important. What will I be playing next? Um, so I have, I have, um, I. That's a very good question. I have a couple of um, dating sims on my phone. I have a long trip ahead of me on on a plane in a couple of weeks, and I may end up playing uh, some of these uh, weird dating sims just because um, I don't know somebody recommended me these games. Um, Maybe maybe I will get into... Uh, I think one of them is called Obey Me. Uh, I want to get in more into Vampire Survivor, which was a, a sort of an interesting an interesting new type of, of, of game. So, so I'm, going to be, I'm going to be on mobile a little bit um, this next, uh, this next uh, few, few weeks. And then what, what am I... I'm not really looking for forward to anything um so i don't know i i i actually have no idea what i'm going to be i'm probably i'm probably going to be playing some some weird indie games i have i'm subscribed to this uh, newsletter called warp door that that does a very good job on highlighting weird games um from each io and i think i mm -hmm. always end up playing one of two of those every week so probably that's what i'm going to be playing i'm sorry i cannot give you sort of a more satisfying answer no it's uh, That's, that's not the goal of our podcast. It's just a friendly conversation about dating sims. So, perfect. yes, that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's always a goal in and of itself. Yeah. So it has been very nice talking to you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, not less, <laughs> for you being on the show today. And it's also a, was a nice uh, nice tune because I really miss Copenhagen and I need to go back. It's been uh, six or seven years since I've been there. So. That's a yeah. while. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Copenhagen wow. is lovely. Gray, gray this time of the year. If anybody listening wants to come to Copenhagen, come in May. May is awesome. Uh, May and June are awesome. Uh, don't come in February. February is the worst. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, well, that, that's a nice fazit, as we say in German. So, everyone, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. Take care and goodbye, Miguel. Thank you very much. Uh, take care. So, dear listeners, I hope you like this episode. If you are an author on and or an editor in the field of game studies or play studies or game research yourself and want to talk about your latest publication, do not hesitate. Please do not hesitate to contact me under rudolf.inderst at googlemail.com. Alternatively, please send me a direct message on social media. You will find me under Rudolf Inderst almost everywhere. So see you in a bit. Take care and goodbye.